All right, if we have any kids in the congregation, you can look right there, the red t-shirt, that is my good friend, Matthew. He's the best. You're gonna learn some amazing things with him. <laughs> good morning, Willow Baptist Church. All praise be to God. I'm still, I'm still fired up from the baptism we just had a moment ago. And I ask you very kindly, like even after, after the service as, you know, maybe a time of fellowship or for anybody going out for lunch or even just hanging out out there in the lobby, uh, if you recognize, you know, some, some of these faces of our, our dear souls that were, that were, that were baptized here. <laughs> yeah, yeah, tell them a good morning and also tell them that you love them in the Lord. If they need anything, if they need prayer for anything, we need to be there because our job doesn't end there with baptism. Jesus said, baptize them and then teach them, instruct them in everything that I have taught you. And for today's message, um, you know, God, God works so beautifully in the way that we, uh, we coordinate like the preaching schedule and even the events that go on here in the church. Uh, many months ago when we were planning this, uh, this baptism service, then we had um, uh, Pastor Paul Havercroft. He's not with us today, but he's also been bringing many messages, very solid man of God. And I was very excited when he and I, we were discussing the preaching schedule for the month of August. And there's like, there, there's a name in one column and the assignment, like what is the passage of scripture that we are covering on that Sunday? And I was so happy, I was overjoyed in fact, that today we're gonna be learning about the story of Naaman. For anybody that is not familiar with the story that is found in 2 Kings chapter five. If you have your Bibles, you can also turn there with me. I'm not gonna read the entire chapter from start to finish, but what I really wanna to present to you guys is how this is a beautiful illustration, a prophetic picture, so to speak of God from the beginning showing what, you know, what is baptism gonna be like in the future? The Jews, even long before Jesus, they already had a practice of immersion. Did you know that? They used this thing, instead of a baptismal, they, what it was called the mikvah. And this was actually only used for the priests. So for example, you read in the, in the Torah, in the first five books of Moses, there are instructions for the Levitical priesthood. This was a group set apart specifically to serve the Lord. And part of the ritual, like the practices that they would use to purify themselves was known as the mikvah, where they would immerse themselves in water. Now, if that sounds familiar, this practice later on was adopted by the Christian community because in Christ, anybody that is a new creation, the old is gone, new has come, we are also co-heirs with Christ and we reign with him as a royal priesthood. That's how Peter would say in one of his epistles. And so everyone, man or woman alike, anybody who places their trust in the Messiah, they could become priests before God. But in the Old Testament, we have, like I said, these are prophetic pictures that in the moment may not have that much significance. It's not until much later when you see things in the light of Messiah and what he has done for us, everything looking back begins to make sense. You see like, wow, look how God you know, was, was slowly revealing his ultimate plan of salvation all the way back in, in the times of our ancestors, like for the Jewish people looking back. And uh, for how many of you, just, just as a show of hands, how many of you are already familiar with the story of name? And you know exactly what I'm gonna talk about. All right, there's not that many hands, which is actually a good thing. That means that a lot of you are gonna learn something absolutely amazing. So just a little bit of historical context first. This is in the latter period of the kingdom of Israel. This was, um, this was during the time when they were at war with the Assyrian Empire, which was in the north, modern day Syria. And they had the, 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 they had the custom of constantly raiding the northern kingdom of Israel, uh, you know, pillaging, robbing, killing people. And the commander of the Assyrian army in this time was a man named Naaman. And the Bible tells us here, he was the commander of the army of the king of Syria, a great and honorable man in the eyes of his master. And, and by him, the Lord had given them victory uh, to Syria. He was a mighty man of valor, but he had leprosy. For anybody that doesn't know what leprosy is, the reason why it's not too common in our time is because it's known, first of all, it's known if you go on Google, it's known as Hansen's disease. It's basically a virus that slowly rots and eats at your flesh. But especially with modern medicine, you can literally just take some pills to treat it. It, is, it still exists, but it's mostly in like very, like very underdeveloped countries where there isn't a lot of uh, hygiene and medicine. And so there are some people that still suffer from it. But in this time, long before modern medicine, it was a very prevalent problem and it was extremely contagious. You could not touch someone who had leprosy or else that virus that was on them that was literally eating their flesh 
would jump onto you. Which is why it was so astounding for the people in the time of Christ that Jesus, like people would run away when they saw someone who was a leper. They literally had to cry out, unclean, unclean. In other words, like stay away, stay away, or else you're gonna get the same disease. Jesus was the only one who could, instead of when everyone else is running away, he would come close to someone and literally and touch them, lay his hand on them and say, be clean. You know, instead of the disease hopping onto Jesus, the holiness and the anointing that Jesus had as God would jump onto that person and bring healing to that individual. But in this time, there was obviously no cure and Christ had not yet come. And so, you know, they had gone out on raids and the story goes, I'm going to just summarize a little bit of the story before we get to the, um, the reading part. Basically, on one of these raids of the Assyrian army, they kidnapped a young Jewish girl and they forced her to be a slave girl to Naaman and his family. And on one occasion, uh, you know, and she, everybody knows what's going on. Everybody knows about Naaman and his leprosy, how he can barely even fight anymore. And so one day the girl, just out of pity, just this, this deep compassion within her heart, she says, I know of a prophet in Israel who could heal, who could heal Naaman. She was talking about the prophet Elisha. Now, for those of you that have been attending here pretty regularly since last month, we've been talking a lot about the prophet Elijah and how the anointing was then passed on and actually doubled for Elisha. He actually performed more miracles than Elijah had during his ministry. And that is why this little girl had the confidence to say, I know that there is, there is someone in my kingdom that knows, like that, that I know the spirit of the Lord is upon him and he can heal. Um, she, said, she said to the wife of Naaman, she, he, uh, he can heal your husband. Now, initially there's a misunderstanding and he, uh, Naaman sends a letter to the king of Israel saying, hey, can you cure me? Huge, huge misunderstanding. It almost breaks again into a quarrel. But Elisha hears about it and sends a message saying, no, it's not like it's a message to the king of Israel saying, bring him to me. So they redirect him and Naaman goes on his way to the house of Elisha. And he is going there with the expectation that he will simply call upon his God, Adonai, the God of Israel, and poof, be clean. Right? So I'm going to send here, yeah. Uh, from, yeah, from verse 10, this is, so this is second Kings chapter five. I'm going to read from verse 10 and Elisha sent a messenger to him, to Naaman saying, go and wash. Another version says, go immerse yourself in the Jordan river seven times and your flesh shall be restored to you and you shall be made clean. 11, but Naaman became furious and he went away and said, indeed, I said to myself, he will surely come out to me and stand and call upon the name of the Lord, his God, you know, wave his hand over the infected place and heal the leprosy. Sorry, I need to turn the page. Uh, there we go. Are not the Abana and the Parfar, the rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel? He's saying, literally saying, the, the Jordan is so ugly and so dirty. Can I just do it there? But he's, he's, he's furious. He was expecting a quick and easy solution. Could I not wash in them and be clean? So he turned away and went in rage. He was furious and frustrated and understandably so. None of us will ever have to experience what it's like to have leprosy. We're literally, uh, I don't suggest you do it before you eat, but you can literally go on Google and you can Google like Google images of what leprosy does to people's hands. It's, it's actually terrible. But his servants, I, lo I love the attitude of a servant, comes near him and spoke to him saying, my father, if the prophet had told you to do something great, something difficult, would you not have done it? He doesn't answer, but he said, but the sermon continues saying, how much more than when he says to you, wash and be clean. In other words, he's saying, you know, this is, he's giving you such an easy task, a very simple command to obey. Immerse yourself in the Jordan River seven times and you will be clean. Had he told you to fight more wars or to climb a mountain or do anything else difficult, would you not have been willing to do it in order to be cured? And Naaman's silence says, well, yeah, in, the, you know, in, that, in that moment of desperation, anything would have been possible. So consider yourself fortunate, my commander. He has given you a very simple task. Why don't you then just obey the word of this God? Sure enough, verse 14 says, so they went down and dipped himself. He immersed himself seven times in the Jordan River, according to the saying of the man of God. And his flesh was restored like the flesh of a, of a young child. And he was made clean. And he returned to the man of God 
and, and all of his aides, he came and he stood before him and he said, Indeed, now I know that there is no God in all of the earth except the God of Israel. Now, therefore, please take a gift from your servants. But he said, As the Lord lives, before whom I stand, I will not receive anything. So he doesn't even uh, accept any sort of reward from him. But put very simply, uh, I don't know if you see the parallels, a very simple instruction given to Naaman. And initially he's frustrated. Initially he's angry. You know, I just, I just want quick and easy solutions. You know, why do I have to, you know, do this, like this thing in this land, it's a foreign land. But that question also applies to us. If God, we always say that we want to serve God. We always say things like, you know, I'll do anything for you. There's many songs that are sung every Sunday morning where, where unintentionally, you know, whether we're aware of it or not, we're just lying to God every, like, at least once a week. The song's like, I surrender all. Do you really surrender all? Things like, I have decided to follow Jesus, no turning back, no turning back. How many times have we actually turned back? We have, you know, there's, a, there's something in our spirit that, that desires to be with God. That's why Jesus said that the spirit is willing. The spirit wants that, that unity we once had with God, but the flesh is weak. But God has given us simple instructions. I, even the other day, I was uh, talking with a brother, uh, one, of the, one of the brothers here who was baptized. And when I told him, when he asked me, you know, how does one get to heaven? I told him what the scripture says, what must one do to be saved? You, you guys probably know Acts 16.31. It says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. You know, and I was expecting his reaction to be like, wow, that's beautiful. His reaction was, that's it? <laughs> it's like, like, wait, wait, like do, you, do you want more? Like, do you want more? It's like, it's kind of like at my, at my workplace, I work at a store where sometimes an item uh, goes on sale, but we forget to put the price tag on. And so I say, oh, this item is just $2. And they say, that's it? And I'm like, you can, you can tip me if you want. Like, if you really want to give more money. <laughs> You know, it's so simple, and yet our human flesh sometimes cannot even fulfill the simple tasks that God gives us. In the Old Covenant, because there was still no Messiah, the people had to perform sacrifices and rituals. They had to cleanse themselves in specific ways. But now that Messiah has come, he is our Passover lamb. He is the lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. He is the one who says, if you have a burden, give it to me. Come unto me, all of you who are weary and heavy laden, for I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, for I am gentle and lowly of heart. My yoke is easy and my burden is light. We serve a God who knows how difficult it is to reconcile a sinful humanity to a holy God. So instead of him expecting us to come to him, he comes to us. The Word, the divine Logos of God, becomes flesh and dwells among us. He is the one who, of whom John said, this is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, the one who did everything possible. He, in this, in this relationship of the lover and the beloved, he is the lover. He is the pursuer. He is the one who adjusts to our weaknesses, who empathizes with our weaknesses. He is the one who rescues us just where we are, from where we are so that we can be where he is. That is essentially the message of the gospel, the good news for all of you here. Many of you are visiting here for the first time and we are so happy that you've come here. And I'm telling you right now that you did not come here by accident. You might have thought, oh, I'm just coming to support a friend, you know, because they're being baptized and this means a lot for them. Yes, it does mean a lot for them, but you know why? This water doesn't have magic powers. This little guy standing before you, it has no power. The only one who is mighty to save, his name is Jesus Christ. And he is the one who has Philippians 2 says that he, even though by his very nature, he was God, he took on the form of a servant and he humbled himself even to the point of death, even death on a cross. We have that there intentionally to be a reminder for every single person that when you are baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the reason is because the Father is the one who loved you from the very beginning. Even while you were still a sinner, he loved you. And so he sent his only son into the world to redeem sinners like you and me. And when you do that, when you die to yourself and you rise with Christ in baptism, the Holy Spirit of God comes and dwells within you. 
Many of us may never have leprosy like Naaman, but leprosy was often associated in the Old Testament as a representation, a physical sign of sin. Time and time again, and that's why even the beggar, like the, um, uh, the, the leper that was begging Jesus, not before him, and he said, if you are willing, you can make me clean. So he knew something about Jesus that many others did not know, that this was the same God of whom everyone needed to be purified to stand in his presence. And that's why he trembled and he said, if you are willing, I know God is the only one who can cure me, the one who can cleanse me of my sins. And that is why we serve a God who instead of saying, well, yeah, get clean first, then come to me. Once you are worthy enough, then you can come and enter my presence. We serve a God that when everyone else is running away, he is the one who steps forward, who caresses that leper in his arms and says, I am willing, be clean. For those of you who have never placed your trust in Jesus Christ, today is your day. You come before him like Naaman, and like that man who came to Jesus, you, and like almost like spiritual goggles, you have leprosy, my friends. We have this disease called sin, and that sin brings death. The consequence, the wages of that sin is death. But the Bible gives us a message of hope that the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord, who humbled himself, was obedient unto death, even death on a cross. God demonstrates his love for you and me in this, that even while we were sinners, while we were those lepers, Christ died for us. The Holy Spirit in this moment, he has brought you here. He has brought you this far to come to him. He is the one opening his arms to you and saying, come to me, lay aside your burdens, lay aside that sin. And the instruction is very simple, my friends. When Peter on the day of Pentecost preached the very first sermon in the Christian church, he told them, this Jesus, you condemned him to death. You crucified him, but now God has raised him and he is now seated at the right hand of the Father. The people asked, what must we do to gain eternal life? For a lot of you, I give you this question. What must you do to gain eternal life? Repent and be baptized, all of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Take a step of obedience, just like Naaman, who he may have hesitated at first. And I know a lot of you have been running away from God for a very, very long time. Stop. Turn around. He is there waiting for you. He is the one telling you, repent of your sins, come to me, and be baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And you will not only receive healing, you receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. God's promise to you is that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord and believe in your heart that he is risen from the dead, you shall be saved. I bless you, dear church, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.